Good afternoon, everyone. Last class. Are you guys excited? I hope so. And um, we'll talk a little bit more later about, about the final exam, all right? So for now, let's, let's just finish with the lectures, with the homework, and then we can talk about some other details. OK. So we were talking about microseismicity. And, and just to give you a, a short summary, microseismicity is seismic emission induced by failure of small fractures when we do hydraulic fracturing. The failure in shear of those planes releases energy, and that energy uh, goes to the surface and to near, uh, near well bores and can be captured with geophones, and then by triangulating the location, and the same as it's done, for example, with the GPS, you find the location of those points, and you can get to know what is the reach of the hydraulic fracture. And this is very useful in order to get to know what is, uh, what is known as a stimulated reservoir volume, or SRV, and also to get to know how far fractures went into horizontal and also into vertical direction. I don't know why I didn't finish this one. This is very important too because we know that these shear reactivated fractures, they also help to increase the permeability of the reservoir. All right, so if you are interested on induced seismicity, something that you're going to see a lot if you work in hydraulic fracturing, I strongly recommend that you read this manuscript, uh, which is if you go to problems, and you have the link right here. And this is a file that tells you the fundamentals about microseismic imaging. And we have some pretty pictures here. Uh, whenever you see some of these summaries from the oil field review, usually these are very good summaries uh, done by Schlumberger and people that work over there and uh, they are very well written, they have very nice images, and this is one example. So, for example, this is just for one fracture, we have our sensors, uh, we have an emission, and when you measure that, the travel times with different sensors, as we say by triangulation, you can get what is the position of those events. And here we have an example with lateral well bores, and the location of those uh, seismic emission points. And notice in this case, for example, how you have now a, a side view, and what they are checking is that the hydraulic fracture does not go above the, the Barnett shale or underneath the Barnett shale, because otherwise you will be fracturing something that you're not, you're not interested in fracturing. And, and here you have another example where you see how these observation wells uh, are used in the subsurface in order to uh, capture better the location of microseismic emissions. Sometimes these locations are very deep. Uh, you have a lot of instrumentation on surface, which creates a lot of noise. So it's a lot better to have observation wells at depth that will allow you to locate that emission. If you do it on surface, probably it's not going to be that good. And out of these a uh, manuscript, um, this problem is where I, I got, uh, let's find the image and then we'll come back, the problem for homework number 11 or 12, number 12, that you have to solve. So you want to, to know a little bit more of, of the background about this image, it's right here. All right, so let me come back over here and uh, I think we were right, okay, right here. Uh, I'm gonna pick it up from here. But let me now come back to the, here, the, the dog camera. All right, so again, we know that when we do hydraulic fraction, we reactivate small planes, but sometimes we, you could bump into, into a fault that probably you didn't see 
when you did your seismic imaging. What would happen if we stimulate a hydraulic fracture near a fault? An anyone has any idea what could happen? Probably you could have a fracture that starts growing, but once it hits the, the fault, the fluids are going to be diverted into, into the fault. And probably this hydraulic fracture, let me do it with colors to be clearer, is not going to propagate any more uh, through the rock, but it will go into the fault. Whether if it goes into the fault or not, if it crosses, or not, that depends on uh, several uh, factors. One of the main ones is the inclination of the hydraulic fracture with respect to the fault. But the main thing here is that if you get to reactivate a fault, now you're going to uh, likely increase the pressure in the fault, and that's going to reactivate the fault and create an induced seismicity which is a lot larger than what you created nearby a hydraulic fracture. And this might not be micro seismicity anymore. It could be seismicity in the order of two, three, four. I think the maximum that has been observed uh, during hydraulic fracturing has been around four in Canada. And, and the reason is that you're not reactivating the small planes you are reactivating now large faults that you may have seen or not. So if we go now to the cross section, very likely that fault goes over the, the net pay, but also goes below and goes uh, above that. And if you reactivate this, let, let me move it. I didn't do it exactly where it should be. So this is the fracture, and this is the fault. Now hydraulic fracture goes up to here. It may go underneath the, the pay zone, and it will create induced seismicity that goes into the fracture close, but also goes a lot into the fault. And the bigger the circle here, the bigger the induced seismicity, I mean, the bigger the magnitude of induced seismicity. So you don't want to do this. You don't want to reactivate faults. Well, once because you don't want to create unnecessary induced seismicity, and second because you don't want to inject all your precious propant and fracturing fluids into a fault because the fault is not going to produce anything. Let me show a little bit of a better image about what I drew, and I have it right here. Let me zoom up, let's see if this works. All right, yeah, this is pretty good. Okay, so here you have an example of, wait a minute, okay, there. Uh, here you have an example of, I, I cannot move the mouse in because otherwise the caption comes in, but uh, here you have an example of a fault which may be uh, reactivated either by injection of produced fluids or by uh, hydraulic fracturing and leak off of some of the fluid that goes eventually into the fault, uh, pressurizes the fault, and reactivates the fault. Uh, both of those cases uh, can reactivate these uh, uh, faults, and in general, uh, you don't want to do that, either with hydraulic fracturing or with injection of uh, produced water. One of the main reasons for seismicity in Oklahoma was the uh, injection of produced water in which they were injecting produced water and backflow water uh, 
24-7. In hydraulic fracturing, that's not the case. You inject in stage maybe one hour or so, and after that, then uh, it, it's finished. But again, if you inject close to a fault, that fault may get uh, reactivated. Question here, uh, what type of fault is that? Can you see there, can you interpret from the figure? What kind of, of stress regime? No. It's a reverse. Why, Mr. Barak? Yeah, high in wall is going against, against gravity and it's going up. The full wall is, is going down. Um, similarly to, to earthquakes, you will find the most, where are the most destructive earthquakes on the earth? Where do, do they happen mostly? Where, are, where do the news come from all the time? Like, uh, most like Japan, right? Uh, Chile. Uh, hopefully we didn't have a big one yet in the West Coast, but they are associated with mostly a, a reverse faulting regime or a state of stress where the maximum stress is horizontal. And similarly with induced seismicity, some of the largest induced seismicity that we have observed, either with uh, reactivation with injection of of produced water or even hydraulic fracturing has been because of stress regime that was either reverse or strike slip. Usually normal faulting will not uh, produce uh, large induced seismicity. So that's another factor to take into account. And in this plot, you see a, a reverse strike slip uh, state of stress. All right, so I recommend that also if you are interested about this, you read this article very short, and, uh, but it gives you a very good idea about uh, induced seismicity today in petroleum engineering. All right, and now uh, let's see. Um, now let's talk about the simulated reservoir volume. Okay, so why do we do this induced seismicity? Uh, we do it because it's very helpful to map what, how far the hydraulic fracture went and what was it, its influence in the rock. And that helped us trace a cloud of points that can delimit what is called an simulated reservoir volume. And it means that because it means that because of hydraulic fracturing now, this rock has been hydraulically stimulated so that many of its natural fractures went into shear failure. If you remember when we talk about 3D more circles or we talk about full reactivation before, well, by injecting, pre increasing the pressure and by doing hydraulic fracturing, many of these fractures, not all of them, not the ones right here certainly, but the ones closer around here, they're going to be reactivated in shear. And as they reactivate in shear, they're going to have higher permeability. And that is going to allow us to define what is called an estimulated reservoir volume. So in this case, I could the limit that the stimulated reservoir volume with that dashed line that I have over here. And let me finish the, this plot over here. We have also here a micro seismic cloud. And my ESRD will look something like, uh, let me add a little bit more of, of points over here.
Okay, and that will allow me to see uh, how far the stimulation went. Why this is useful? Because we find that, in general, the bigger the stimulated reservoir volume, or SRV, the bigger is going to be your cumulative production. In general, if you have a small stimulated reservoir volume, you will have small production. If you have a high stimulated reservoir volume, you will have more production. And somewhere in between, uh, probably you have points like that. And this is what we see. Uh, let's assume that these are different uh, hydraulic fracture completions uh, in the same region, but with different wells. This is what we see over here, and this plot that now in the in the x-axis you have a he they call it. Uh, let me remember what they call it. What is the E for? Uh, effective stimulated volume, but it's the same thing. Okay, uh, the stimulated reservoir volume in the x-axis production in the in the y-axis and the bigger the stimulated reservoir volume in general the higher the production and you know here they're doing the same thing just uh, delimiting those regions for different stages of the uh, seismic activity and proportional to that you will get uh, your production before we get into computing production numbers let's see very quickly two reasons why you might have a lot of a large volume stimulated by little production. Do you think why you w we could have this? What might be going on? And let's assume that it's, it's a good rock it has hydrocarbons in it, but uh, you create a bunch of micro activity, but not much is coming up. The reason for this would be that you have unpropped fractures. If your fractures are not propped, then they're going to close very quickly. If you if the fracture close very quickly, the production is going to decline <coughs> very quickly as well. There are two solutions for this. One is micropropant, and that would mean to use a propant which is uh, very small, usually uh, smaller than 70 microns or so. 70 microns more or less is the thickness of your hair. So we're thinking about propane, which is uh, smaller than that. And the other solution would be also to use acid to etch the surface of the rock. So in that way, when the fractures close, but your surface is etched, then you still have some conductivity in your fractures. If you come up with another solution, you can, you may become millionaire from one day to the other. So think about that. All right. And there is another case in which you don't have a lot of induced seismicity, but, uh, but you have a lot of production. Any, anyone can think of an, uh, an idea why this would be the case? Um, well, a high permeability of, of the reservoir. It, it could be, but let's, let's assume this is a tight reservoir. If you had natural fractures, probably they would have also emitted some induce seismicity. Mm. 
the reason is, this is not an easy one, but uh, the reason is something which is called a seismic slip. And that means that uh, there are some fractures that although they get reactivated, uh, they do not emit seismic emission <coughs> because of the, the properties of the rock and because uh, when you change the velocity of uh, which they shear with respect to each other, sometimes they become stronger. So if they become stronger, they do not release very quickly all that, all that energy, but uh, they uh, release some of that through heat and through some other mechanisms that uh, do not release all that strain uh, uh, very quickly. But the main message here is that you should know that this is not, as I showed in the previous paper, that it's a very nice correlation. It's, it's, it's not the case all the time. So that uh, you should apply it to uh, places that, that you know very well to see if there is a correlation or not. Okay, so, but let's assume now that we have a, a, an assimilated reservoir volume that we can trust. And with that simulated reservoir volume, what we want to do is to calculate what is going to be the estima estimated, um, the estimated ultimate recovery or EUR of an unconventional. So what is EUR for any type of reservoir? What? Yeah. So, so, but what is the question for that? Recovery factor times. Well, well let, let's go step by step. Origin all in place, right? So, we have a certain amount of original all in place, we have recovery factor, and that's going to be EUR. Okay, now let's go to original all in place. Original all in place, as you were saying, is going to be the pore volume, so it's gonna be porosity times volume of the net pay in general, and if that not all the pore volume is filled with oil, so we need to take away the water saturation. For the homework, I forgot to put water saturation. So assume a reasonable water saturation or do some research about what is a reasonable water saturation for the shale and put that number in there, okay? And, and because we want this on surface uh, units, we're going to divide this by the volume factor and let's assume this is oil. All right, so here is the main difference between conventional and unconventional. And it's about the volume. In a conventional reservoir, what you would do is you will, here in this number, you will put the volume of the net pay, right? Because that's how you calculate it. If you guys are working on your design uh, class and you have a conventional reservoir, that's what you did. You have net pay and then you multiply that times uh, the values of uh, porosity uh, and oil saturation and that's your original oil in place. In a conventional reservoir, you assume that even if you have a very large reservoir, just put one wellbore or a few wellbores and you'll get most of it. The, the real picture is not quite like that, but, but you're assuming that just by placing a few wellbores, you're gonna get almost so, all, all of it. Well, in unconventional, it's not like that. You, you can have the biggest shale in the world like, I don't know, let's say the, the, the wolf can. But you're not going to be able to drain it unless you have a wellbore and fractures very close to them. And because of that, here, what you're going to put is the stimulated reservoir volume. Your true net pay is, is, is not the extension of the entire shale. You could say I have uh, trillions of dollars in, uh, in my 
property, but uh, you're going to have some real value need when you do hydraulic fractures and you place a horizontal well. Before, you, you have nothing. So here, uh, you need to use a simulated reservoir volume, and the simulated reservoir volume is going to come uh, from here, and it's going to be closely related to micro seismic emission. So now with these two uh, properties, the simulated reservoir volume from micro seismic emission, and then your properties from logs, then you're going to be able to tell what is the uh, simulated, uh, the estimated ultimate recovery. So finally, the UR is going to be recovery factor, porosity, one minus <coughs> saturation of water, stimulated reservoir volume, divided the uh, volume factor. And that's it. Let's talk about the, the homework. Uh, do you have any question about this so far? No? All right, so then let's go to the homework. This is what you have to solve for the last problem of the homework. But let's go in order. All right, problem number, number five. I added the link so you can download that file and uh, it's, it's nothing here because it takes me a little bit more work to, quite a bit more work to update this one. But I put that link on Canvas and you have to construct this uh, stress log and you should get something similar to what I have over here. Be careful with the units. You can easily mess up the units and that's going to be something that doesn't make any sense. Make sure that your, for example, your velocities are in the order of 1,000 meters per second, that your plane strain modulus is in the order of about 1 million PSI, maybe, maybe less, maybe a little bit more, but it's, it's not going to be 100 million PSI. It's not going to be uh, 10,000 PSI. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't give you like a straight line. It's also a straight edge. Is that wrong? That's wrong. Okay. No, no. SV should be, uh, it's not going to be in a perfect straight line, but it's going to be more or less straight. So there might be something there that, are, are you adding the previous value to each column? Yeah. Well, that's what you have to do, right? Yeah, yeah, this is summation. Every value is a summation to whatever is on top. So the stress that you feel in this location is the weight of everything on top. All right. And, uh, you know, you, you, you should know how to do this. And after you apply the equations for SH max and SH mean, you should get something similar to this. And uh, from here, uh, you can tell uh, where, where, where are going to be the sweet spots for hydraulic fracture? Do you guys have any question about this problem? Did you start working on it? Yeah? So it's okay? Easy? All right. So again, pay attention to your units, okay? All right. Let's go then to problem number six. Problem number six it's a problem that requires to, to use the equations of the PKN model. You have a fracture height, uh, you have an injection rate for the entire wellbore. So remember to divide that in two to get just for one wing. And then uh, after that, you have to compute uh, what is the final volume of the fracture. And, and based on that, uh, how much, uh, how much water and how much sand you need to use. Did you guys finish that problem? No? Well, some of you, you did, but basically you have to compute this 
uh, three things, fracture calf length, fracture width, fracture width with the PKN model, which is this one. And, and here you have an example. Okay, for the example, remember guys, uh, take a look at all the examples in the notes, plus the, the homework and the examples we do in class. So here you have one example with a PKN model and then what you should get. For this one again, don't try to convert all the units during the exam, okay? Uh, I'll try to be, you know, as nice as I can with the units, but there are some units that you should know how to convert from field units to SI units. And with these PKN equations, uh, you're gonna have to convert all of those to SI units and then you can convert them back to field units. So remember the units. And uh, after you get that, you can also get the volume of the fracture. And here, uh, you also you have an example of how to compute the amount of sand and the amount of water that you're going to need. So th this, is, this is pretty straightforward. And if, again, uh, here's an example about how to solve it. It's not going to be very difficult. And Let's go to the next one. All right. This one, it's something that we have already more or less done over the, the entire time of this class. I give you a place. I tell you what is, I give you hints about what is the orientation of the horizontal stresses. Uh, I'm assuming this is a normal faulting. And I'm asking you there, to tell me what is going to be the direction of the wellbore in which you should drill that wellbore and what is going to be the expected geometry of the hydraulic fracture. And for this problem, I am also asking you to tell me what is going to be, where is going to plot that wellbore in a semi-hispherical projection, the one that we use for drilling. You remember that? that we talked that a horizontal wellbore is going to plot on the stereo net on the outer zone of the stereo net and a vertical wellbore is going to plot in the center. And anything in between, any deviated wellbore is going to plot uh, in between the center and the, and the edge of that semi-hespherical projection. All right, let's do, for example, one example over here. If you were to drill a wellbore here in the DJ Basin in Colorado, and considering that this is the direction of SH Max, what would be the direction of your wellbores, your horizontal wellbore? North 60 East. Um, so more or less somewhere over there, you're saying? Something like that? Um, everyone agrees with that? Okay, wh why is that, Mr. Barakia? Yes, so in the direction of, in this case, the minimum principal stress, and we, we are assuming in this case, this is either normal or, or strike slip, right? And uh, yeah, that would be the case. Uh, let me add a mark over here. And the second part of the problem is about calculating what is going to be the minimum principal, the minimum pressure required to open this wellbore, a lower bound. And remember, you know, th this is one of the main things uh, I hope you remember from this class. The minimum pressure required to open a hydraulic fracture is going to be the minimum principal stress. The minimum principal stress that we calculated either with the Poisson ratio method with uh, 
sigma 3 equal to uh, Poisson ratio divided 1 minus Poisson ratio times the effective vertical stress, or with the other method of equilibrium of faults that we said, for example, normal faulting that sigma 3 uh, would be sigma 1 divided the parameter Q. E either of those methods is going to be uh, is going to be good for this particular problem to calculate the minimum principal stress, the minimum principal horizontal stress, either with elasticity or with equilibrium of faults. And actually, you will see that those numbers are are quite similar. It's it's about uh, 0.3 or one third. Okay. Any questions about this problem? No? Well, then, then let's just go to the last one. In the last one, I'm giving you a problem of interpreting a cloud of micro seismic emission. So here what you see are is a top view of three wellbores that start in this path and then they go into the laterals around this region. They go into the payson, and then you have zipper fracturing in these stages uh, in these three different wells. These three wells, they are not at the same height. If I remember correctly, the two ones on the side are a little bit higher than the one in the center. And what you see here with colors is the uh, it's a different stage. So for example, the first stage here, uh, it's the one in green on this wellboard, and then you have the one in, uh, that is the first stage for this wellboard. The first stage for the second wellboard is the red, and they alternate in zipper fracturing. And you can see that more or less the cloud tells you how far the hydraulic fracture went and also more or less the strike of the hydraulic fracture. All right, so probably, you know, if uh, it's, it's a little bit better here towards the, the toe of the wellboard, you will see the cloud is more or less oriented in this direction, um, northeast, southwest. So if this is normal faulting, then that will tell you that the hydraulic fracture is around here. It's a plane in this direction. A plane like that. So by interpreting what is the, the cloud of this micro seismic emission, you could tell more or less how long the fracture length is and also by interpreting the entire cloud, you could also calculate what is the stimulated reservoir volume. For this particular homework, I am not asking for precise numbers, okay? So just, you know, with a little bit of, of eyeballing and uh, more or less estimating what is that uh, reservoir volume, uh, <laughs> you'll be fine. For example, if this were up to me, I would just draw a box from here to there and also through here, and I would say this is stimulated reservoir volume. Uh, this is the, the, the surface. Multiply that times the thickness, and, and then you get your stimulated reservoir volume. After you do that, uh, and after answering a few more questions about the fracture half length, and you also have to, to look for the distance between the well bores. But uh, after you have all of that, and you assume this porosity, this recovery factor, uh, this formation volume factor, and uh, a water saturation, a reasonable water saturation, then you're gonna be able to compute EUR. And I want to ask you one more thing, which is not in here. Once you get all of that, that EUR, multiply that times the price of oil, and calculate what is the value of, of that. 
and you may go ahead and compare that with what is going to be the value of or the cost of drilling three wellbores and completing three wellbores, which we could estimate uh, in, let's say, four to five million dollars each wellbore. And, uh, and let's see if, uh, if you are able to recover your money out of this or not. OK? So let me see if I forget something. Uh, mm, no, I think that's uh, everything. And uh, for the homework solution, uh, we're going to upload it tomorrow. Our exam is on Thursday, right? So le let me check that again. And let me see where that is going to be. Uh, do you guys have any question about anything right now? No? Are you guys going to, to stop by this afternoon for the special lecture? You guys going to Sharma's place? Yeah, okay, I understand it. But just because you're going there, you're not coming to the special lecture. Um, all right. Okay, so then Thursday morning and uh, the place, I'm, I'm gonna look up for it, but uh, uh, you, you can find it there in, in the registrar. But I'm gonna add it here just in case. So, for the exam, then, I was telling you that uh, we're going to post the homework tomorrow after you submit your own homework. And for the study guide, I already uploaded the file that tells you what is what you need to know about uh, hydraulic fracturing. And reservoir depletion is not going to be in there, okay? So don't worry about that. But if in the future you work in geomechanics, I strongly recommend that you check this chapter on reservoir depletion because it is very important for uh, infill wells. It's very important for drilling through already depleted reservoirs uh, because sometimes your fracture grading changes a lot in that area. Actually, that's a real concern in the Permian that you have to drill through already depleted reservoirs in order to get to the source rock, and some of these regions are, are quite problematic. But this is not, this is not going to be uh, in the exam, so don't worry about that. And um, the exam is going to be one hour and a half, so don't worry, you're, you're not gonna be spending here three hours for the final exam. It's going to be similar in length to the midterms, and also similar in level of difficulty. And, uh, and I think that's it, guys. Uh, just a few more things, uh, you know, just to conclude about this class. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, paying attention, for attending class. And uh, we have seen, you know, just a very fast overview about geomechanics. There is a lot more out there that uh, you have to learn if you get involved into geomechanics, and I hope this was a good introduction. Uh, I've heard from some students that, that took this class before that it was a very good head start for them when, for example, they went into an internship or they started working in topics related to this, that whenever they go to uh, some uh, other classes, they, they see that you know, they understand this a lot faster and they are uh, well ahead some other people. And, uh, and I, I think that's valuable, and I think that, that, that you guys uh, are in that uh, step ahead when, uh, when you start working in topics related to geomechanics. So, so I, think, I think this is it. Uh, keep in touch, okay? Add me in LinkedIn if in the future uh, you have any question, just stop by, by my office, send me an email, send me a message through LinkedIn, I'll be able to help you. Okay? If you have any question for the exam again, uh, stop by my office, send me an email, I'll be glad to help you. Uh, if not, I'll see you directly 
uh, Thursday 9 a.m. Okay? See you guys. Take care. Thank you for the clapping. <laughs>